Bibles. You may see a Bible in front of you. That if you don't have one, please take it. That's yours. That's our gift to you. We're on page 1,240. And it begins like this. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grab a seat. It's my delight. He needs no introduction. Maybe he does, but he's an amazing friend. Tyler from Bridgetown, lovely to have you. Thanks, man. <laughs> Lord, I pray uh, that by the power of your Holy Spirit that has plunged into the inner being of anyone and everyone who calls you Lord, that you would animate the passage that Garrett just read for us and bring it to life in our midst in the next few minutes. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Megumi uh, uh, was asked to joined the church staff that I led in New York City temporarily under the job title Interim Children's Ministry Coordinator, which is code for, we need someone to look after the kids, but we don't have any money to pay them. Would you hold us over? Uh, she agreed. Six months into that, I offered her a permanent position on our staff. She said, I'd like to think it over. She later told me she had no interest whatsoever, but didn't know how to let me down gently in the moment. Needed some time to figure that out. Uh, she had a great full-time gig in the nonprofit world with a pathway toward upward mobility that she was already walking. And as she prayed, she began to feel this pull from God to give up all of that to be a part-time children's ministry coordinator at a church plant. Now, in New York City, not unlike L.A., a full-time job with benefits and upward mobility will get you like half of a shared bedroom with 12 roommates and seven cats and an apartment with asbestos. <laughs> a full, or, or I'm sorry, a part-time position at a church plant that exists entirely on local donations is an absurd strategy for stability. But she just couldn't shake the sense that God was saying, this is where I'm leading you, follow me and I'll take care of the rest. So fast forward with me a couple of weeks, we're at a prayer meeting at our church of a friend of mine who just happened to be in from out of town is uh, joining us at the prayer meeting and he interrupts in the middle of the prayer and says, excuse me, ma'am, um, I'm, I'm so sorry, I just had a picture and I think it's for you. He's never met her before, has no context of the story at all. He says, it's a picture of an abacus. Now, if you know what an abacus is, it's the worst toy in doctor's office waiting rooms. Um, <laughs> But it's a, it's a tool for arithmetic, for counting. He said all, all of the pieces were moved to one side. And I felt through this picture that God was saying that you're weighing a decision right now. And all of the human wisdom is on one side of the equation. And yet you're feeling this pull from God to choose the side with no human wisdom on it. And I think he wants to say that is me. Take a risk. Follow me. And I'll take care of the rest. Does that make any sense to you at all? Tears began to stream down her face, and I slid the job description into her hand at that very moment. <laughs> Just kidding about the ending. Um, so how did Megumi end up discipling a whole bunch of kids at Oaks Church, Brooklyn? Well, so Scripture can explain all of her beliefs. She can tell you everything she believes about God, about herself, about the world through the Bible. Scripture can explain her beliefs, but she cannot tell you her story without the active speaking voice of God today, or what the Bible calls prophecy. The foundation of her life is biblical truth, but the shape of her life is prophetic. A God who has never stopped speaking in the present, just as he did in history. A God who will never stop speaking to and through us to lead us. So I get to be here with you over two Sundays. We're talking about one single theme, hearing God. We got our start a week ago by talking about hearing God personally through the practice of discernment. And today we're going to pick up from there talking about hearing God communally through the gift of prophecy. Now prophecy, just to get us all on the same playing field, the definition that I would give it is to hear and speak God's voice 
on behalf of an individual or group. But before we go even a step further, I want to acknowledge that the second that you drop the P word in a 21st century American church, the room immediately splinters into three distinct groups. Some of you have a longing for the gift of the prophetic. And so you are already thinking, yes, it's about time. Let's get weird. (laughs) But it's possible to have a good desire to know God in any and every way that he's knowable without actually having a biblical foundation on which to set that desire and grow it in a healthy way. And if that's you, I want to give you a biblical foundation on which to place that desire. Others of you will hear a word like prophecy and you will immediately get more concerned or uncomfortable than you will excited. And that could be because of unfamiliarity. Like maybe you grew up in a church tradition or denomination that more or less brushed aside topics like prophecy and passages like the one that we read from this morning. Or it could be because of a painful past experience like familiarity with the prophetic. Uh, You might have been on the receiving end of a toxic or manipulative prophetic environment or teacher, and therefore the safest place for you to stay is far away from anything that might resemble that place again. And if that's you, I want to explain the incredible gift that God has given us in his voice and why we should long for and pursue it, not run from it and fear it in spite of what you may have experienced in the past. And then finally, some of you are thinking, I've got no idea what you're talking about, man. It seems like you think you might be stepping a little bit on controversial grounds, and I'm just thinking, this is turning into a pretty long intro. And if (laughs) if that's you, then that's probably the perfect starting place. Uh, So today, I want to explore the biblical theme of prophecy three ways, biblically, communally, and personally, in that order. Ready? Ready? I hope so, because I'm going to do it either way. Okay, so first, prophecy biblically. There is no era of biblical history without the prophetic. The Bible, stripped of prophecy, is a story that will not hold. Why don't we start in the beginning, the very first words in Scripture, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, in Hebrew, the original language of the book of Genesis, it reads, and the Ruach of God was hovering over the waters. Ruach is a Hebrew term that can be translated equally into English as either breath or spirit. So the spirit of God was hovering, or said with a little bit of imagination, God was breathing on the unformed chaos. And what happens when the breath or the spirit of God touches unformed substance? Creation. God speaks creation into being. Stars, land, sea, animals, plant life, all of it comes by the breath of God. God the Father creates through the Holy Spirit. When God speaks, his breath or his spirit goes out and creation happens. Turn just a single page to Genesis chapter 2 and I'll read from verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So last of all, God creates people, and something unique happens. God puts his breath into the ones that image him, and that sets people apart from every other creative thing. So the question you should be asking is, why would God give people his breath or his spirit? to go on creating. People are called God's image bearers, and the very first biblical command is to what? Does anyone know? To be fruitful and multiply. To create, just as the creator has been doing. Rule and reign over creation. Work the raw materials of this world into a fruitful ecosystem. Create. And then, of course, there's that whole bit about the forbidden fruit, a tragic scene that is summed up as the fall. Human beings were always meant to be God's image bearers, and yet sin stole his breath from our lungs, so to speak. And that brings us to the Old Testament, where God's redemption strategy mirrors his creation strategy. God just keeps on speaking. He recreates in the very same way he created at first, through his breath or his spirit. For instance, Numbers chapter 11. Then the Lord God came down in a cloud and spoke with Moses. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they 
prophesied, but did not do so again. So when the presence of God falls like a cloud around Moses, what always follows? God speaks. He speaks to Moses. And then in response, Moses goes and speaks the words of God to the people. That's prophecy, remember? Prophecy is to hear and speak God's voice on behalf of an individual or group. But in this passage, some of that same spirit was given to 70 others. And what immediately follows? They all begin to prophesy. They all begin to hear God's voice and then speak the words of God to one another in community, but did not do so again. So it's temporary. It's not an ongoing gift. It's a divine moment. And Moses is the beginning of a biblical pattern where God selects certain people and communicates with them directly, and then those people go and take the private whispers of God and share them publicly. These people are called prophets, but they are the exception, not the rule. So the good news here is that God keeps on speaking, but the bad news is that not everyone is experiencing prophecy in all of the same ways. But there is this very telling moment in Numbers 11 uh, where there's a desire within Moses that points forward to where the story is going. Verse 29, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So Moses realizes that his experience of God is the exception, not the rule. That the very best of the intimacy that he has with God is not yet shared with everyone in all the same ways. And he longs that everyone would know God's voice as closely as he does. That's a long that points ahead to the same spirit prophetically speaking to and through everyone in a community like we see in this divine moment in Numbers 11. That brings us to Jesus, who became the Word of God in human form, meaning that Jesus himself is a living, breathing, walking, talking prophecy. And after his death and resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples, and we read in John chapter 20, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Here is my breath for your lungs. Here is my ruach, my spirit put within you again, just as it was at first through my resurrection. Keep turning in the right in your Bibles and you will come to the book of Acts when the church was founded on the day of Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples that Jesus breathed on in John chapter 20, just as he promised. When those waiting and praying disciples receive the Spirit, something predictable happens. They all immediately begin to prophesy. They all start speaking the words of God to one another in community. Everyone starts acting like prophets, just as they did in Numbers 11, and just as Moses foretold would happen. Peter then stands up to explain what's going on to everyone else, and he says what you're seeing is exactly what the prophet Joel said would happen. I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. God's promise in the Old Testament was, there is a day coming when my spirit, my ruach, my breath, will not just be for cameo appearances for a special few, but will become the common experience for all of my people, just as I always meant it to be. And that promise is for children and for seniors, for men and for women, for the rich and for the poor. All people, all who receive me, get my voice. And what was sensational on the day of Pentecost then becomes ordinary as the church matures. Joel's prophecy in Acts becomes Paul's instruction in 1 Corinthians. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Paul in this very chapter goes on to write, I'd like all of you to prophesy. An echo of Moses from all the way back in Numbers 11. All of you? Yes, because all of you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. All of you now permanently carry what the prophets of old only had for particular times and particular purposes. That is why this gift is called prophecy in the New Testament, because it is the ordinary experience of what was extraordinary before Jesus <sighs> breathed on all of us. That's the biblical story. 
a story in which prophecy is not an optional subpoint, but at the very heart. John, Peter, Paul, Mary, Timothy, Nympha, Priscilla, and Apollos, all of them can explain their beliefs entirely by Scripture, but not a single one of them can tell you their story apart from prophecy. The foundation of their lives is biblical, and the shape of their lives is prophetic. A God who has never and will never stop speaking in the very ways that he does on the pages of Scripture. That's prophecy biblically. And everything I've said up to this point is generally agreed upon from tradition and denomination across the board all the way back through church history. However, there are certain denominations within the modern Western church that would say, yes, that is absolutely the biblical story, but that part of the Bible no longer applies to us today. And in my honest and humble opinion, I would say that a theology that God no longer speaks prophetically through his spirit today, uh, as, as he did at every turn in the biblical story, is a belief that is constructed not on the foundation of biblical teaching, but rather on the foundation of a lack of experience. I've never experienced it, so God must not be into it anymore. But of course, whenever there is a gap between what the Bible teaches about relationship to God and my experience of relationship to God, that is not a reason for dismissal, it's an invitation further in. It is a gap that God longs to close. And that takes us from prophecy biblically to prophecy communally. 1 Corinthians 14, our teaching text this morning, is the biblical manifesto on the use of the gift of prophecy in the local church. So I wanna draw out the four basics of the fundamentals of this passage in these four words. Ordinary, intimacy, way, and Jesus. So first, prophecy is the ordinary experience of church life. Here we have an entire chapter of the New Testament devoted exclusively to the use of the prophetic when the church gathers just like this. So the assumption behind this entire chapter is that when God's people gather, God will be speaking to us through one another. In fact, in the New Testament, the church receives written instruction directly related to the healthy use of the gift of prophecy in the letters to the Romans, Corinthians, Thessalonians, and to Timothy, and in the epistles of Peter, Jude, and Revelation. So it is the common biblical expectation Dallas Willard, who is as widely respected as anyone is across traditions in the, in the modern church, writes this. If we look at the advice on how to run meetings of the church, or I'm sorry, and how the meetings of the church were supposed to proceed as given in 1 Corinthians 14, we see that they assumed numerous people in the congregation were going to have some kind of communication from God, which they would be sharing with others in the group. In other words, if it's the church you're in, Expect prophecy. I remember the first Sunday morning of my uh, only sabbatical to this point in my pastoral life. I had spent the previous year saying goodbye to the church that I planted and led in New York City and was about to say hello to the church that I had committed to lead in Portland, Oregon. And I was kind of in a haze from the hectic nature of walking communities through those sorts of transitions and got to settle in for a couple months of rest with my family in Hawaii on the island of Oahu in between those two assignments. But I couldn't stop the wheels that were turning in my head that had been turning for the last year. I couldn't stop rehashing conversations that didn't go the way that I wanted them to in ways that I wish I had said certain things different. I couldn't stop writing sermons in the back of my mind that I actually didn't have anyone to preach to. It was time to rest, and I knew how to slow down my body. But my mind, that was a very different story. And so I remember that Sunday morning as my family was about to walk to the small church that met in a sweaty high school gymnasium down the street from our Airbnb. And I prayed, God, you've brought me here to rest and I don't know how to rest. I need your help. Please help. 
speak to me today. And then we go to this church and I couldn't really tell you anything about the music or anything that the pastor said from behind the podium. But I can tell you this, that at the close of the service, the pastor got up to give a benediction to dismiss the congregation. And this guy who had been sitting in the back walked up with him and he said, hey, Jordan here felt like he had a prophetic word for someone. And so I'm gonna give him space to share that. And he says, yeah, you there, just points directly at me. <laughs> so I saw you walk in and, and this picture flashed through my mind and my interpretation of it was that God was saying, this is a man who is here to rest, but he doesn't know how to rest and I want to teach him. So if that resonates with you at all, I'd love to pray with you after the service. <laughs> what is that? Oh, that? That's just another Sunday. That's just the ordinary experience of church life. If it's the Bible that is forming our expectation for church life. Secondly, prophecy invites intimacy. Humor me for just a second with an exercise. Would you all just close your eyes for one moment? Now, as an experiment, with everyone's eyes closed, I want you to attempt to identify the voice of the speaker. Who is speaking right now? Okay, open your eyes. It was me, right? <laughs> it was my voice that you heard. How do you know that? because you know my voice. Which is interesting because most of you have been following Jesus a whole lot longer than you've been listening to me teach. And Jesus himself said in John 10, his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And so if you've been following Jesus a lot longer than you've been listening to me talk, then you should definitely know his voice as well or even better than you know mine. You see, the question isn't, uh, does God speak to me if our basis for our expectation for God is Jesus himself. The question is, am I listening? But of course, it's not quite that simple, is it? Because for anyone who's ever tried to hear God, experientially, God makes himself available to us, but not always obvious to us. And so hearing his voice does take some practice. It takes tuning ourselves to a different type of listening than you're engaging when you listen to me. And that means that as we are attuning our ears to God's voice and attempting to hear him in a way that he might speak prophetically to me on behalf of someone else, mistakes are gonna occasionally be made. Like I, I remember Simon, a, a leader in a uh, church that I previously led, a very close friend of mine. I named my middle son after him. That's how much I revere and respect this guy. And he was on the Metro North one day, which is the train that takes you from the city into upstate New York, meaning it's longer train rides than you get on the subway. And he sits down, and a woman who had purchased the ticket right across from him, he said he immediately felt like God spoke a word related to her vocation that he was meant to share with her. They had a 90 minute train ride and so he did what any sane person would do and thought I'm gonna wait 89 minutes and then I'm gonna share this with her <laughs> just in case it gets weird, you know? But the, the prompting just kept getting stronger. And so eventually, uh, right at the beginning of the train ride, he just said, excuse me ma'am, I'm so sorry to interrupt you but I know this is gonna sound crazy but I felt like God spoke to me on your behalf and I'd love to share that with you if that's okay. Yeah, sure, go ahead. And he describes the word and he says, does that resonate with you? And she says, not at all. I don't even work in that industry. And he's like, okay, thank you so much. <laughs> that, that is what learning the shepherd's voice feels like. The only way we learn is by risk and obedience. There is no formula, there is only familiarity. So if we are ever going to tell stories of wide-eyed wonder at the power of God through the prophetic, we're gonna have to tell some stories of failure we're gonna have to be willing to laugh at ourselves because it's God we take seriously, not ourselves. And we're gonna have to learn that a prophetic word when it is offered in humility and love does not destroy someone if it does not hit the bullseye. Mature families know how to thrive together and they know how to fail together. They know how to celebrate one another and they know how to laugh with one another. And mature churches do too. We learn his voice by risk, so we gotta be willing to get it wrong if we're ever going to get it right. And as you take risks on God, his voice becomes more frequent and more familiar. But of course, on the flip side, if you're not willing to risk appearing foolish from time to time, you're gonna have a really hard time learning the voice of Jesus and following the shepherd's voice. In the Bible, God does occasionally speak audibly. 
Like there is that thunderous, this is my son at Jesus' baptism. He occasionally speaks audibly, but most of the time he speaks in a whisper to individuals. That is God's preferred method of communication. Why? Because of intimacy. Because he is leaning in and longs that we would lean into. He wants us to know him, not just in the booming, earth-shattering moment, but also in the coming and going every day of our ordinary lives and ordinary environments. Prophecy is not an invitation for you to become a world-traveling seer who wears gowns made of 100% hemp. Pro prophecy is an invitation, but you can if you want. I mean, that's on the table. Prophecy is an invitation to lean further into intimacy with God and to know more deeply the voice of your good shepherd in your ordinary, everyday life. Next, prophecy should be weighed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 eventually gives instructions not just to the one speaking the prophetic word, but the one hearing and receiving it. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. Likewise, in 1 Thessalonians, we're told to test all prophecies, keeping the good and throwing out the bad. So that for the recipient, prophecy should be received freely, but then weighed carefully. We should weigh every prophetic word we receive according to at least this three-part method, scripture, Jesus, and trust. Like first, does it align with the teaching of scripture? Secondly, does it sound like Jesus? And then third, do I trust the character of the prophetic voice? There are a whole lot of warnings in scripture about watching out for false prophets. A good life bears good fruit. So does the prophetic word emerge from a life that is bearing good fruit, a character that I can trust? The blind spot in so much fear uh, around the prophetic is that everyone talks about the danger of prophetic voices, right? What are we gonna do about the manipulation of the prophetic? What are we gonna do about people that use the prophetic to massage their own ego rather than to love someone else? I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna teach the practice of weighing the prophecy as the scripture instructs. What scripture never instructs is to fear or silence the gift because it will be abused by some. Scripture teaches that prophecy surrenders to love, that's for the speaker, and that we honor the gift by weighing the word, that's for the recipient. And then finally, prophecy points to Jesus. All prophecy points to Jesus and reveals Jesus. This is exactly what Jesus himself was getting at on the final night of his life when he taught, all this I've spoken while I'm still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. David Fritch says the primary role of the prophetic anointing is to reveal God to the human heart. So teaching is a gift by which God uses a human voice to tell people about his character. Prophecy is a gift by which God uses a human voice to show people personally his character. Because it's one thing to be told that God loves you. Jesus did that. But the Holy Spirit, through prophecy, pushes the revelation of God's love from the intellect, where it can be understood and even remembered, down into the heart, where it can be lived from, and the emotional floor that it can be felt from. Romans chapter five says, God pours his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes the doctrine that you already believes, believe and turns it into a revelation that you get to live and react from. The Spirit takes biblical rumors and makes them real to us. Jesus made us sons and daughters of our Father. That is an unchangeable fact that is based on his grace and not your performance and does not fluctuate with your emotions. But your experience of that fact Somehow getting that logical principle down from something that you sing about on Sundays and taste on your tongue with bread and wine into the deepest place within you that you live from on a day-to-day -day basis, well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says that God is love. The Spirit makes that real to me. Scripture says that God is running out to meet me and to clothe me in royal robes, to welcome me back to the home that I left before I even knew I was walking away, but it is the Spirit that's the experience of that forgiveness. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. The Spirit is the experience of that love. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, the Spirit is the experience of that grace. All prophecy 
points us not in new directions, but toward Jesus. Old Testament prophecy was all about revealing Jesus when he would show up. New Testament prophecy is all about revealing Jesus in the context of my everyday life right now. Prophecy personally reveals God in a way that plunges through the intellect right down to into the deepest places of the human heart. I remember helping lead this church retreat with a friend of mine. And it was the very final morning of the retreat. Everyone's about to get home, uh, head back on buses together to the city. And my friend that was helping me lead the retreat stands up after the final teaching and says, hey, I'm gonna take a massive risk here. I felt like God speaking clearly revealed to me that there is one among us who has a suicide note written on their desk at home and you wrote it before you came on this retreat, and this was a last ditch effort for God to save your life, and you're leaving disappointed, and you fully intend to take your life before you go to bed tonight. Is that someone here? And someone pops their hand up. And this guy from the community had crafted a suicide note, left it on his desk back at home. He had given God one last ditch effort to speak to him. He was leaving disappointed. He fully intended to take his own life before dinner that night. And he's alive today, worshiping Jesus and a part of that community. Why is that? Because it's one thing to be told that God loves you, that he's numbered the hairs on your head and the days that you will live and that he has surrounded you with his love and that it's not time for you yet. But it is quite another thing to be told that Jesus was weeping with you while you crafted that note. That he knows every thorn that has gotten stuck in your foot and everything that is causing you to feel the way that you feel and to be in the midst of the moment that you are in your story. That he has numbered your days and knows your individual hairs and he is saying, It's not time yet. I've got more days for you to live and I've surrounded you by a community that loves you enough to support you and help you weather this storm. That is when the love of God that you already believe in and recite gets delivered to you personally in a way that you can receive in a moment and start reliving from a resurrection kind of life from that moment forward. Do you see the difference there? One is an unchangeable truth based on God's grace and not your performance. And the other is the experience of those facts in your individual story in a moment. That is the work of the Holy Spirit that often comes through the prophetic. How are we doing? Are you guys tracking? I'm moving quickly because I want to get to the good part. Are you guys tracking? Cool. Okay, one more. Prophecy personally. So if I want to grow in the prophetic to experience God more and to become a megaphone through which he speaks lovingly and personally to others, where do I start? Four words again, okay? Desire, ask, encourage, guard. I wanna tell you how to grow up in this gift. Desire, ask, encourage, guard. First, desire. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Now, I don't know about you, But when I eagerly desire something, I think about it constantly. I look for every sign of its arrival. I enjoy even the small bits of it that I get before I I get the whole thing. Like for instance, I live in a part of the country where we have this thing called seasons. (laughs) If, If you're a SoCal native, seasons are these changes in the climate and horticulture that sort of mark the passage of the year. And Annually, during the waning winter months, I eagerly desire the arrival of spring. By which I mean, I look for every bud on every tree that might indicate that spring is coming soon. I check my weather app constantly to see if it's going to be warming up and the sun coming out. I enjoy a 60 degree day like it's 85 outside. The English eagerly is the Greek zeloo in the original text, which literally means to set one's heart on, to deeply be committed to something. It's a term that Paul uses not just here, but three separate times in this very letter for the posture that any believer should have toward the prophetic. Some people relate to God's voice passively. Like, look, if God wants to speak to me, I'm right here. He can come and find me. 
And behind that posture is often a fear of manufacturing an experience that is something less than purely God and only God. And I get that 100%. I also am completely uninterested in emotion or hype or psychological tricks that I perform on myself. But to relate to God's voice passively is to completely ignore the straightforward teaching of Scripture. Eagerly desire. I think constantly about God's still small whisper. Look for every inkling that he might be speaking to you. Soak up every word from his lips like it is the first day of spring. We in today's church, we tend to eagerly desire better teaching. Right? We love great teaching and we have favorite preachers. And don't get me wrong, I love sermons and I've got some favorite preachers myself. But nowhere in scripture are we instructed to eagerly desire the gift of teaching. Now, I think this misconception that, that keeps a lid on the maturity of the modern Western church, this misconception is based, or I'm sorry, that, that desire, misplaced desire is based on the misconception that my words, Tyler's words, are the most important ones that are gonna be said in this worship gathering today. And God does not see it that way, my friends. See, if God eagerly desires to pass his redemption through ordinary human vessels from one to another, and so we should eagerly desire to hear his voice. God does not want a team with a few star players. God wants a team where everybody gets to play. And if we really believed that, we would eagerly desire prophecy. If we really believe that God is generous and abundant and tenacious in his pursuit of every last soul, but equally stubborn and insistent on bringing about redemption through the likes of ordinary people like you and me, then maybe we'd be more likely to ask, God, is there anything you want to speak to me today on behalf of a brother or sister? And that brings us to the second way that we can grow, ask. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. You see, the gifts of the Spirit are just that, they're gifts. They're not techniques. And a gift is not something you master, it's something you receive. So do you want to increase in the gift of prophecy? Then ask for it. Pray, tell God that you want it. But don't just ask generally, ask specifically. Meaning, don't just tell God what you want, but tell God why and how, or why you want it and how you will use it if he gives it to you. Uh, you see, when we get specific in our asking, then our desire for a gift like prophecy can be refined by love. Uh, our motives get kind of picked apart as we articulate them aloud to God. Our ego gets weeded out of the desire. We are made more mature recipients of his power when we don't just ask, but ask specifically. Follow the way of love, we are told, and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. You see, prophecy is a gift for building up the church precisely because prophecy surrenders to love. Prophecy becomes dangerous when it is done by any motive less than selfless love. Like when it's primarily about your spiritual expression or when you want to turn the local church into your spiritual playground or when it's your way to say something that you really want to say to someone else but then cloak it in a spiritual disguise. Ask and ask specifically so that God can refine your desire by his love. He's a good father, meaning he's not gonna put power tools in the hands of children. And when we ask specifically, we can grow up in his love that we might be mature enough to hold his power. Third, encourage. Prophecy is given to the church for strengthening, encouraging, and comfort, our passage tells us. So prophecy and encouragement are closely related. Encouragement is prophecy by what you can see. Prophecy is encouragement by what you can't see. So if you want to grow in prophecy, just start with your eyes open. Like, what have you noticed in someone else in this community that you've thought positively about them, but it's never made its way from your mind to your lips? What have you admired in someone else that if you articulated it, it might deposit courage into their inner being, but the truth is you've never done the uncomfortable and slightly vulnerable thing of going up to them and articulating it to them. Become a person of encouragement. 
if you want to become a person of prophecy. And then on the flip side of that, guard your mouth. As it says in James 3, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water come from the same spring? If you want to, God to use your mouth for the building up of his kingdom, then guard your mouth from destruction. Like, do you curse casually or joke crudely when it gets a rise out of someone else? Do you find yourself frequently gossiping under the guise of venting or uh, in, in the company of someone that you think is trusted enough to say this thing about someone else who's not there to defend themselves in front of? If you want God to use your mouth to build someone else up, then don't use the same mouth to tear someone down. Prophecy is not ignorance to a person's faults, but neither is it about the correction of faults. Prophecy is not about the calling out of the false self, it's about the wooing and the romancing of the true self. A word of prophecy is to reach into someone's inner being and to call them by the name that God called them at first so you can pull that truest and deepest part of them up to the surface. So if you want God to use your mouth for blessing, make it your ambition to eliminate cursing from your mouth. Make your mouth a pure sp or a spring of pure water, to borrow an illustration from James. So I'll land here for today. Back to that community I led in New York. There was this one particular weekend when my friend Pete was in from London to preach in Brooklyn a few years back, and at the end of teaching, after he closed in prayer, he said, I've got this nagging thought, and it just might be God, so I'm going to go for it. I think there's someone in this room and you're really self-conscious about your teeth. And it sort of like looms over you all the time. Like you, you've learned to try to keep your lips shut and you try even to hide your smile or cover up your laughter. You never stop thinking about it. And earlier that morning, uh, Pete had preached at our sister church across the city. And so he said, he added, look, and to be completely honest, I shared this exact same word over at the other service earlier this morning and no one responded. So it's quite possible it's just the weird burrito that I ate for dinner last night, but maybe it's God, so I'm, I'm going for it again. So if that's you, I think that God is highlighting that today because he wants to reveal his love to you right in the very personal place of your hidden embarrassment and maybe even shame. And as he says that, this guy comes from the back, weeping, like down the center aisle of the church, and just falls into Pete's arms at the front of the church. And he says, I was at the other service this morning across town, and you shared that word, and I knew that it was for me, but I just didn't have the courage to come up. And I left, and I couldn't stop thinking about it, and so I prayed, and I said, all right, God, I'm going to get on the subway. I'm going to go all the way across the city, and if he says the exact same thing again, I'll know it's you, and this time I'll respond. And he's just weeping at God's individual pursuit of him, God's relentless desire to pour his love into this guy's heart by the Holy Spirit. But that's not the end of the story. My friend Natasha also responded that morning, and I went to pray for her, and she said, Tyler, I was intent on telling you today that I'm out, that I've been wrestling with doubt for a while, and I'm not sure if I believe this stuff, but all I know is that I'm tired of trying to sort out those questions from within the context of this local community. I just can't do it anymore. I'm out. But if that's who God is, if he's powerful enough to speak everything into being just by the breath of his lips, but he's also personal enough to use that same breath to speak love into something as small as someone's insecurity around their smile. If he's really that powerful and that gentle, that mighty and that loving, then I want to know him. And she began a journey that day. And if you fast forward six months, she was growing increasingly into a person of prayer. And if you fast forward another 12 months, she was heading up a team that opened a storefront house of prayer on Broadway in New York City. But the story's still not over. Within the last year, a woman approached me at one of our worship gatherings at the church that I now lead in Portland. She worked in the medical field and had happened to be in Portland all the way from Florida for a medical conference. And she explained to me that she'd been listening to our podcast for a while and thanked me through emotion and gratitude and handed me this letter that I opened several days later. And when I opened the letter, she went on to tell me her story, that she had been recommended a sermon from Bridgetown Church on the topic of prophecy in, fall of, in the fall of 2001. 
And so she took a walk in the park near her house and she popped in her earbuds and she listened. And in that sermon, I told this story, the teeth one. Because I've only got so many stories, you know? Like I've only lived one life. There's only so much material to work with here. But that story really connected with her because she is an accomplished physician, really successful, but she has always had in her own estimation very bad teeth. And that's been a source of massive self-consciousness for her and even social anxiety. And she's sought out medical intervention and even surgery to try to repair it. She's always tried to keep herself from smiling. She's even tried to hide or learn to laugh with her mouth clenched. And so she's on this walk with her earbuds in and God just starts washing her and healing. And she's meeting God in such a personal way and she is weeping as she's encountering him. It's beautiful. And because she didn't just listen to a sermon, but instead encountered God, she continues this uh, weekly ritual. She takes a walk in this park every Tuesday, and she listens to the sermon from Bridgetown Church. And that went on for 12 months. 12 months later, she's on another one of those walks where this park has kind of turned into holy ground for her when she encounters God. And I tell this story about being in high school and falling in love with Jesus on prayer walks in this park called Philippi Park in Florida where my family briefly lived when I was in high school and she falls apart because that's the park that she's been walking in all of these years and that the very place that had become holy ground of encounter for me had become holy ground of encounter from her on the opposite corner of the country. So let's trace this story back to its root, shall we? Pete's at a church in New York City and he feels like God might be leading him to share this prophetic word that has nothing at all to do with the sermon that he's just been preaching and to share it in spite of the fact that he already shared it earlier today and it was a total dud. <laughs> and he journeys through that risk to, out of love, share that word again. And because of that, one man has a profound encounter with the love of Jesus and another person who just by being in the room when a prophetic word was delivered to someone else, journeys through her doubt to come back into relationship with Jesus and, and a fire is lit in her that then blesses all sorts of other people. And then another person, years later, encounters Jesus on the opposite side of the country as she hears God speaking to her and walking beside her in this park where she has been encountering him for a year. That is the power of prophetic prayer, my friends, that it reveals Jesus. Jesus healing the self-consciousness and shame around my smile. Jesus coming and finding me in the doubt that makes me want to walk away. Jesus walking beside me as friend in the park where I've been strolling and encountering him for the last year. Jesus. You see, I eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. But that's not because I'm enthralled with signs and wonders, and it's not because of a particular personality style or temperament or bias toward experience. It's because life is hard, and it is contested at every turn. But God's love is strong. God's love is so strong that one day it will remain after everything else passes away. And it's because God's love is poured into our hearts even right now today through the Holy Spirit. And so if prophetic ministry is a vessel through which God's love flows, then I want all of it that he will give. So why don't we try it? Yeah? Let's stand together.